Hello, today is Tuesday, June 23rd, 2015, and I am your host, Sue Brown, and welcome to Info to Rail, your freight train to modern media. How y'all doing today? I want to welcome you to you all to our show, and we have a great show in store for you today. We are very fortunate to have psychic detective Noreen Renier with us today. Um, I always give you guys a little insight into the weather, that's craziness of weather that goes on here in Canandaigua, New York. And we had what appeared to be a pretty nasty um, electrical storm this morning at about 5.30. And I guess a lot of people in Canada and surrounding areas don't have electric yet. Um, it was crazy. I had read on Facebook uh, sometime in the middle of the night that there was a solar um, storm. And uh, it was due to, to hit, you know, touch down on Earth here uh the morning of the 23rd and that was this morning and that was one crazy heck of a storm i don't know what you guys got where you are but we got a little bit of of a uh, a show out here the rain was blowing in circles and it was crazy crazy wind and lightning and thunder for me i love that stuff so it was beautiful um normally i do a little glimpse into the missing persons files um today i want to take uh, a special time to dedicate this show to um, a special girl um, who was murdered back in 1975, and her name was Sharon Pryor. Um, she was 16 years old, and uh, she was murdered um, on March 29th, 1975. And I want to read to you um, a little bit about her life from www.sharonpryor.com. Um, this is what it says. Um, Hello, I'm Sharon Pryor. I'm 16 years old. Easter weekend, Saturday, March 29th, 1975. I got up that morning, had breakfast, washed, dressed, and made my bed. Mom went shopping to get the extra she needed for my Easter dinner, including chocolate eggs and goodies. Jojo, my brother, who is 11 years old, and Stephen, my foster brother, who is 4 years old, still love to search for Easter eggs. My twin sisters thought they were too old to search for eggs. This is 1 p.m. I decided to make and paint Easter eggs. I hard-boiled eight eggs and let them cool. At 3 p.m., Mom came home. She sat at the kitchen table and watched me paint the eggs. I asked her if the paint would be dry by morning. She suggested that I paint half the eggs in egg cups, then turn them over and finish them later. Mom especially loves Easter because it means spring weather, blooming flowers, birds chirping, Children with skipping ropes and bola bats. Mothers strolling with baby carriages in a time of spring fever. She said that she gets that funny, bubbly kind of feeling like it's great to be alive, and that's just the way I feel. At 3.45 p.m., after I finished painting half the Easter eggs, I told Mom that I was going to go pick up my Leo boys jacket at the club. To get the jacket, I had to sell a few books of raffle tickets. I had been going to the Boys and Girls Club since I was six years old. They have all sorts of activities, swimming, basketball, and floor hockey. I belong to the teen center. I asked Mom if I could take Stephen with me. She said yes, and off we went. When I got to the club, they told me that they did not have my size, but gave me a receipt so I could pick it up another day. I was thinking perhaps ordering a smaller size for Stephen because he didn't have a spring coat that fit him properly. At that time, they gave me... My girlfriend's jacket. I dropped it off to her on the way home. 4.15 p.m. I came home and continued painting the eggs. At 4.30, a reverend came over for a visit. He came to say hello and to wish us a happy Easter. He brought us a big box of chocolate turtles. He is so nice. We all sat around the kitchen table while I was painting the eggs. I asked Mom if there were a was a book in the house to read to Stephen about the Easter Bunny. But before my mom could answer, our reverend said, Why don't you tell him how Easter really came about, Sharon? I smiled and said I would. Our reverend only stayed 45 minutes. I think he knew it was almost supper time. Grandma, Mom, the twins, Jojo, Stephen, Doug, my mom's friend, and I all sat down for supper. Stew. None of the kids liked stew. I ate a little anyway. Yuck. I can't wait for turkey dinner tomorrow. After supper, I washed the dishes. Maureen and Doreen dried. I placed the Easter eggs carefully on the shelf so Stephen wouldn't break them. B. 
between 6 and 7 p.m. My girlfriend came to the house. She lives on the same block. I've known her since I was five years old. Although we have been friends for a long time, my girlfriend didn't hang around with my group of friends. I think it's because we both went to different high schools. I told her I was getting ready to go to Marina's Pizzeria. We kept joking around. She was laughing at me because of how many times I kept changing my top and looking at myself in the mirror to make sure I looked okay. In the end, I wore one of my mother's tops. Marina's restaurant is on the corner of Wellington and Ash Avenue. A lot of my friends hang out there. It's sort of a meeting place. We have soft drinks and talk about everything boys to the latest music. It is only five short blocks away. I was worried about wearing my brown suede jacket because... It was raining outside, but my mom said it was just drizzle and not enough to hurt it. I didn't want the rain to ruin my coat. Goodbye, Mom, I said as I went out the door. Goodbye, Sharon. Be careful. She always said that. My girlfriend was already downstairs and on the sidewalk. She asked if I would like to walk, would like her to walk with me to Marina's. I said no, but thanks anyway. I crossed the street and went on my way. This happened in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Um, and this is the newspaper paper article um, for her disappearance. It says, Sharon Pryor, a reliable and friendly 16-year-old girl from Point St. Charles, it was still missing this morning more than two days after she left her home at 445 Congregation Street, Saturday night. Police and volunteers, mostly classmates from Verdum High School, continued the hunt through Point St. Charles today for the girl who disappeared oh, no, she didn't say no for Disappeared without a trace after leaving home 7.15 p.m. Saturday. I just want my daughter back, the girl's mother, Yvonne Pryor, 37, said this morning. She was always so reliable. She went out on Saturday nights and was usually home by 11 p.m. or 1 a.m. at the very latest. She always called home if she thought she was going to be late. Pryor said her daughter left home to go to the nearby Marina's Pizzeria at the corner of Wellington Street and Ash Ave to meet friends and a boyfriend, John McAllier, at the, rec at the restaurant, but she never arrived. She went there a lot, the girl's mother said. It was a sort of a hangout for the kids at school. I don't think she was planning on running away from home because she left her school bus pass and money behind in her room. And all of her friends say they never heard her talk about running away. Anyone who thinks he or she has seen the 5 foot 3 inch, 105 pound, blonde haired, blue eyed girl is asked to call police. This was the first one that, um, the first article that is posted on here. Um, later they found her body, and this is um, the article that I found on here to read to you guys. Police spent yesterday sifting fact from rumor and the violent death of Sharon Pryor, the 16-year-old Point St. Charles girl whose raped and mutilated body was found in a Longuini field Tuesday night. The girl disappeared about 7.30 Saturday night from a street near her home. According to a preliminary autopsy report yesterday, she died probably Tuesday of asphyxiation caused by blood in her lungs. Police said she probably hemorrhaged internally when her assailant crushed her chest with his knee. The autopsy showed several bruises on her face, two fractures on her jaw on both sides of her mouth, a broken nose, and a hole in one cheek, probably caused by tooth loosening during a struggle. The autopsy also showed that the girl had been raped. Sharon disappeared during a five-minute walk between her home at 445 Congregation Street and a neighborhood restaurant, a favorite teenage gathering place at Wellington Street and Ash Avenue. Sharon's body was found in a field at Kamen Dulac and... Guamond Boulevard by a beekeeper who lives nearby and keeps hives in season beside the field. He went to investigate when he heard that the gate leading into the field was open. When police arrived, the body was clothed only in a three-quarter length 
suede coat, a sweater and shoes, and socks. Her jeans and her panties were about six feet from her body, the underwear hanging from a tree branch. Detective Sergeant Jackie's Dorisak and Renaud Lacombe, sorry, I'm not good at these name things, um, investigated the slaying for Longuini police, thinking the assailant may have driven into the field, thrown the girl onto the ground, and then gone back to his car to get her jeans and underwear. He must have thrown the clothes towards her body because the underwear, lighter than the jeans, was hanging from a tree branch when we arrived. The jeans were on the ground about five or six feet away. Near the girl's body, the police found a shirt, tire marks, and a footprint. The shirt was a, with a size 17 collar and 36-inch sleeves indicated a man about six feet tall. The depth of the footprint indicated a man weighing about 200 pounds, said police. They believe the shirt was used to bind the girl. Longuil police said that when they found Sharon's body, partially chewed tape was tangled in her hair. They believe it was used to gag her. Police believe the man knew the area where the body was dumped. The gate was equipped with a padlock, but it was not hooked. He was able to drive across the frozen ground, but the police car sank in the mud. Frozen mud yielded good tire marks and aid in identifying the car. They believed the assailant picked the field in advance in the belief that the body would not be discovered until beekeeping resumed in the nearby hives in late spring. Sharon probably died Tuesday afternoon, according to the preliminary autopsy report. One investigator said that it could indicate that days before the girl may have accepted a ride from someone only to be attacked later and left in the field. Another theory is that she may have been kept prisoner for three days by her assailant. Investigator noticed that Sharon Pryor had never run away from home, was considered well-behaved and reliable, and was on her way to see school friends and her boyfriend at Marina's restaurant. She left her bus pass and money in her bedroom. But investigators say they won't mo know exactly what happened to her until they trace her whereabouts following her disappearance. She always called home if she thought she was going to be late, The girls said the girl's mom, Yvonne. Um, Frank Daly, 35 of Wellington Street, manager of the restaurant where Sharon was headed, described the girl as very clean, very straight. I've been living in the point all my life, and I knew the girl quite well. She was like a daughter, a very smart girl. We got a lot of school kids in here, he said, gesturing across the street. Most restaurants don't want the kids because they make a lot of noise and don't spend a lot of money. But the owner said, I have talked it over and decided we don't mind having the kids here. We don't mind a million of them, but we don't do too badly either. Sometimes it sounds like a barnyard, but they don't behave too badly because there are boys and girls here together. They come here to yak. They are still coming here, but the girls never walk alone. They come in groups. Police are considering the possibility of a link between the prior slaying and the slaying of Norma O'Brien last summer. Twelve-year-old Norma was found mutilated and sexually molested in a field not far from her home. Police investigating the slaying are expected to meet soon to compare notes. More than 100 Point St. Charles residents and police had sent several, spent several days searching for Sharon. Yvonne Pryor, mother of the slain girl, was given sedatives by a doctor when she learned of her daughter's death, but she sent a family friend to the front door with this message. Just tell all mothers to watch their daughters and to love them. That's a very hard thing to read. Very, very hard. Um, since then, there's been several articles, uh, several you know, leads that have been chased down. And to this day, they're, they're still um, searching for some sort of hope that they can find who did this and bring them, bring some justice to their daughter and their, you know, their family member. Um, 
it's just devastating. It's it's so hard. It's hard for me to talk about because it's, you know, I'm so sorry to that family and all that they've been through. And I just hope, you know, somebody out there can help bring justice to this for this girl, you know, and, and for this family. Um, you know, this, this stuff is, it's devastating, but, um, I wanted to dedicate this show today to Sharon and to her family in hopes that, you know, somebody somewhere knows something and can bring justice to Sharon. Um, so, you know, as you listen to this, go on and check out, uh, and, and check out all the articles that are on the bottom of the page. And, you know, maybe somebody knows something um, that they can add to this. But um, I just want to say to the family that I pray for you every day that you find justice and that justice is, is you know, definitely gotten for, for Sharon. She deserves justice. But she's a beautiful angel shining down on you right now. And uh, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, we're going to take a short break right now, and we, when we return, we will have Noreen Renier with us. Stay tuned. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back with Noreen Renier. In 1981, when psychic investigator Noreen first lectured at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, her work with police detectives was considered controversial. Now she's a highly respected psychic detective who was has worked on over 600 unsolved cases with city, county, and state law enforcement agencies in 38 states and nine foreign countries. She has a professional understanding of both the police and the paranormal. Hello, Noreen, and thank you so much for being on Info to Rail today with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Um, can you start out by telling us about you and how you got started as a psychic detective? Uh, well, the shorter version is uh, I used to be a skeptic. I didn't believe in, in people uh, that claim the things that, that I now do. Uh, I, I was in advertising and PR and uh, worked for a Hyde Hotel and when a psychic or someone representing a psychic wanted to rent her our lecture hall, which, of course, you know what psychics look like. They, they are usually heavy set, wear strange clothes and a big nose and have a wart or pimple. I, I know what those people look like. <laughs> I didn't want them at Hyatt. So I tried to discourage her, but she called and called and called her. Not her, not the psychic, but her friend. So finally I agreed to meet the psychic. Uh, went to her office. She had a pink suit on. Uh, she didn't have a wart or pimple on her face and had a very tiny nose. Uh, she knew I was skeptic and did some stuff on me. And I thought, well, somebody could have told her about my kids. Somebody could have told her about that. But then she said, uh, I see that you just got a brand new chair for your office. And no one knew that because it had just arrived moments before I left to meet uh, meet with her friend. So that sort of impressed me. Uh, the next thing I did is uh, she gave me a bunch of books to read. And I think at that time in my life, a good science fiction book would have been more credible than people traveling into the past, seeing the future, fighting crimes. Uh, it just none of it made any sense or logic to me, which, of course, logic and common sense really don't go in the psychic world. Uh, so uh, I started practicing on, on the hotel people. Uh, holding rings and watches and townspeople that would come out for lunch. And I didn't work for about three months. Not, not a good psychic because I got fired after three months of practicing on everybody I could find. And I was sort of devastated because I had two kids to support. So I dressed up like a gypsy and went to a nightclub. And I figured nobody would know me there. I could practice. The main thing was practicing to see if it was real. So that, that's how I started. That is pretty fascinating. Um, can you tell us, uh, you've worked with the cops um, in the past on some cases? That's been my career for the last 43 years. I've worked with police all over the world on unsolved crimes. My specialty is uh, homicide and missing persons. The first five years of my career, uh, I just worked on homicides. 
uh, I could, uh, uh, for some reason, it was very easy for me, and I was afraid to do missing people because I have a terrible sense of direction, and I can get lost in, in Kmart. So I wasn't, but then finally, I had to go in that area, and the first thing I found was an airplane. Uh, FBI agent's wife had, uh, all this is in my book called A Mind for Murder. Uh, it's on Amazon.com. But the, uh, she came, she called me, and at first I said, no, no, I, I don't do missing people, much less missing airplanes. Uh, I'm, I, I work on homicide cases. And she said, please, you've been highly recommended by the FBI Academy. Uh, my husband is an FBI agent and, and agent wrestler. Uh, agent wrestler was a, a behavioral science uh, uh, agent, and he's the one that first invited me to Quantico uh, a long, long ago. Quantico is, you know, is where they trained uh, agents all, all, all over and, and retrained police officers and law enforcement officers and, and foreign officers, too. Uh, but that's uh, for every three months, uh, get invited back and lecture to them. I don't know what I had to say. I didn't have that, that much to say, I, I, but I must have. They kept inviting me back. Uh, and so that, that's how I was exposed to so many police all over the world. And then, of course, they would invite me. I didn't know I could do it over the phone. I used to travel. Uh, and it was a lot, a lot of work traveling and a lot of, uh, you know, uh, time. And I learned how to do it over the phone. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your book, A Mind for Murder? Well, uh, it tells about how I, sort of what I'm telling you now, only in more detail, how I began, uh, how I started my career. Uh, a lot of the cases I've solved, uh, are not a lot are in there, just a few are in there, but uh, it just tells how I work on, on crimes. Uh, homicide, you know, used a certain way, and, and the uh, missing persons is totally different. Homicide is easier because there's so much emotion involved in the killing itself. So what the police would do, or the detectives would do, they would send me something that was on the body. Now, I worked all over. Uh, they would send me something that would not not hurt or, or, or jeopardize their case. It would be something simple, but it would be something that had been on the body that I could just go back in time and see that energy. And because they were all skeptical, I mean, I, and I expected the, to them to be, and I liked that because I was skeptical myself. So them asking very specific questions was wonderful. They wanted to know how she was killed. And I would do that in the beginning to warm up. Uh, first of all, they would never tell me, it wouldn't be, this is Mary Smith. Uh, they would just say it's a homicide, and then when they called me, they said it would be Mary. I never knew the last name, never knew uh, uh, most of the time uh, uh, anything about the case because I didn't want to use my logic. Uh, so they would say, oh, "Okay, so we got Mary, a homicide." I would describe Mary, how she looked alive. I did this more for me than even for them because I wanted to make sure I really was doing this right. Uh, so once I yes, that's how she looked when she was alive. Okay, now I'm going to be killed. Uh, and then I would feel, in, in those days, I was such a skeptic, I actually had to feel the knife cutting my throat. I actually had to feel uh, the pain the person was going through. Uh, so that's how I, I did in the beginning. Then then once they gave me a lot of yeses, then they would ask their questions. What did the person look like that killed Mary? And I could work with artists. For some reason, it's very easy to see the face, and I learned how to do one feature at a time. Uh, and I had a, my own artist for like five or six years. He was a police sketch artist, and he was wonderful. Uh, but the police could use their own artist, too. Uh, so we'd give them a face, and everything was tape recorded. And then I would have it transcribed for them. So they tape recorded it, I knew, and I had it tape recorded, and then we transcribed it. So all my files are, are very well documented. Not only is there a tape recorder, uh, a tape of the session, there's also a transcription, I would say the majority, not every single one, but the majority of my cases. So that's how basically I, I do homicide. Um, so um, I've been reading tarot cards since I was little. Um, it's always come uh -huh. really. It's it's always come easy to me. Um, I also am a paranormal investigator. Um, I love getting out there and you know seeing what the kind of the footprint that's left behind um, when they say there's a haunting and such. Um, I work. Oh, good, good, good. 
I chatted with It's a, all interesting. Good for you. Yes. I chatted with a woman um for a while from Canada and um her 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 sister his name is Sharon Pryor and when she was 16 years old she ended up going missing. Um they ended up finding her body. Um she had been killed, but to this day they still cannot figure out who did it. Um, for me, you know, I can't explain it for me. It's it's not, I can't put myself there like you do and, and go through the things that you do. But the more I read through um, everything that had to do with this girl's case, the more, you know, I, I kept saying in my mind that there had to be someone else that was murdered or assaulted in that time frame or right around that time that was connected to this. And it kept bringing me back to this. Well, I kept going back to, I came across this one girl, and as soon as I saw her name, I don't know why, but I kept saying, it's the guy that, that hurt her. Well, this girl had gotten away, and she had the opportunity to, you know, describe the guy that had tried to hurt her. Well, as soon as I saw her name, I don't know why, but it just pinpointed it, that that's the guy that did it. Well... Well, it could be your psychic. Don't keep saying, I don't know why. It had to be your psychic ability that's doing that. You know, psychic has no logic to it. It just pops in your head. And that's why I think people say, I don't know why, but I just felt this. But you sound very talented. So what happened? Um, well, I had talked with her a little bit. And because I'm not, you know, a psychic investigator or anything, um, I don't I don't trust myself in, in this kind of a situation. But I'm so almost positive in my heart and in my everything that this was the guy. And I had told her, I said, it's the same guy that had hurt this, you know, Cheryl girl, Cheryl Roy, that he had attacked her and she got away. But I can't help but to believe that that is him that did it. And they're still to this day looking. And it's it's devastating. Um, you know, just to lose somebody like that in... in feel like you're never going to have the answers to bring, you know, some justice to your loved one. I mean, for you, when you're, when you're doing this, do you, I mean, you can actually, how do you get yourself in that frame of mind where, you know, well, well, you know, and every, let's just clear up, you know, I do it my way because I taught myself how, how to do this as a skeptic. Everyone does it differently. And then one thing I did have is a lot of confidence in, in what was coming through me. So I never, sometimes I would go, what, stripe it wallpaper? No one had stripe it wallpaper, but I would t- say it anyways, and there would be stripe it wallpaper in that room where the person was killed. Uh, so I stopped doubting myself very early on uh, and, and this what you sound like you can you 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 feel like it's the same thing what's holding you back from telling the police that well I mean I don't want to I for me I don't want to accuse an innocent person and that's you know he obviously wasn't innocent in the incident that he did to this other girl but I don't that's me I'm so worried about you know accusing an innocent person or coming forward and saying that this is what I see or what I feel but this case has I mean I have on my show on my info to rail show I post missing persons on every show and I talk about them on every show this is something I'm very very you know, so into, I'm so emotionally connected to this because I can't even imagine, I have four daughters and I can't imagine being a mother out there searching for answers for my child. You know, right, but that's usually, that's that's why I'm I, I'm usually called the last resort. You know, when the police can't, they don't never call me in early. They, I, I'm usually five, ten, fifteen years later is when when I'm hired to, to work on these cases. Uh, but you've got to be brave enough. It, it, you just say, "This is what I feel. This is what I see." You know, you're not, you know, if it fits. The detectives are not going to go out and arrest the man. They'll do some research. Well, he's probably already in jail. Uh, but, you know, they, they do research. They, they don't just, uh, you know, leap. Well, for this case, um, this was back in 1975. And I don't know why. It has to be my psychic abilities. But it was something that drew me to this case. Um, you know, I, I used to go through and read this stuff back when Kaylee Ann Poulton came up missing. Um, she was right from East Rochester and I'm from Canadegua. So she was, 
you know, 40 minutes away, and I was out on the railroad tracks looking for the her big wheel and, you know, any place I could be just looking for that little girl, whether it was a body or an alive child or whatever I could do. And, I mean, I was pregnant. I was almost ready to have my baby, and I was still pounding the sidewalk uh, looking. Uh, and this is, this for this case, I mean, I feel like, the answers are right there. But, you know, this family, they suffer so much with the justice part of it. Well, I, you know, it sounds like you're fixed on this one case. I have jillions, hundreds, and I can't get emotionally involved with my cases. I can't. And that's why I never work with the families. It has to be with the police because the families are... Or, you know, having your mind, like you have in your mind so much information, what you feel is right. Uh, I, I could never work with you on this case because uh, I, I could just read your mind. Right. I just feel a connection. Like, I, I can feel her pain, you know. And it's it's like I just, I feel what she went through, that the torture and the 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 horror that she lived through. I can feel it. And it's... For me, you know, I always wondered, is, could I ever do this kind of stuff? Because I would do anything to be able to help these people have closure, whether it's to find a, you know, a family member's body just to give them the closure or bring someone to justice. I just think it's amazing what you do. I appreciate that. Yeah. What was your biggest case? It's always the last case, each case, each person, like, just like what you described. Each person, uh, if their family member was killed, that, that's the most important case. Uh, you know, they're all, there's no one that's more important. You know, if it's a, a individual shopkeeper or, you know, a very important CEO that I'm working for that's hired me, they're all important. I think the most unusual, though, is, is the missing airplane. Because there's just no way I, I thought I could do that, and I could. I gave longitude and latitude, uh, described everything. Uh, the FBI did the search. Off-duty agents uh, did the search with the Civil Patrol, and and they of course found found everything. That's fascinating, you know, to be able to to do that. Just, but you know, it's not that. You know, it's just again having the confidence. Yeah. But if you get a chance, it might help you. It might give you some clues on how to use your own ability, uh, the mind for murder. Um, can you tell us about your book, The Practical Psychic, and what that's about? Uh, yes, uh, The Practical Psychic. You know, I started teaching long ago. Uh, started teaching, I believe, the first place I taught was the University of Virginia. Uh, I was under the umbrella of Ian Stevenson, who who was great into reincarnation. He hadn't been out of the country at that time, so they hired me, uh, and I've been teaching ever since. And the book is is a breakdown of, of what I teach my students, you know, how how to become aware of of your own abilities and how to use them, how to test your own self. So. Uh, if you can get a copy, uh, it has to be reprinted right now. It, they sold them all out. Uh, That's great. Uh, so it's going to be going in, into reprint pretty soon. But it it's just what I teach, basically. That is great. I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to it. I definitely, when that comes out in reprint, I definitely would like to get that book. Um, I have, for me, for the some... Amazon is still selling it. Amazon has copies still. Oh, they do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. For me, um, I think my biggest psychic gift for me is deja vu, and I'm not sure um, how it fits in, you know, or, or how it ever started for me, but for me, if there's something that's going on that I feel like I've been here before, um, you know, I race, for some reason, my mind races right to the end of that situation, and I see the outcome of it, and it's always bad. So for me, it's that, it's that you know, interrupting the time, interrupting the flow of that process to stop whatever bad is at the end of the, you know. Well, give me an example of, of a deja vu thing you've had. I don't quite understand. Um, like if my daughter, my 13-year-old came to me before and she asked me if she could go to her friend's house. Well, she had gone to her house before. Well, for me, you know, when she said that, at that exact moment, it hit me um 
even though she's asked to go here before, this was a different situation that hit me. I've been here before, and my mind raced to the end of it, and the outcome was bad. Um, there ended up that the father ended up getting in an accident after he'd picked up my daughter. And for me, it was so real because I was I was there and I watched this happen in my mind and it unfolded. And it's different. Well, that's not, okay. that's not deja vu because your daughter wasn't killed before. Deja vu was when it, when it happened before. Your daughter was never in an automobile accident before. Well, I know, so but... I would consider that more psychic than, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I feel like you just clicked in on, on the future and what was going to happen. Well, I that's what I figured, too, but in my mind, you know, I've been there before, and I've already done this in my mind. It's I replayed it in my mind like I'd already been there and done this, and as soon as I got to the outcome at the end, I said, nope, you can't go. And she said, you always let me go, and I said, this time I can't because it wouldn't be okay. It wouldn't, this would not end well. And it happens to me a lot. It's, it's. Oh, so she didn't go so that, so it never happened. I didn't allow her to go, but I know as soon as I told her no, and I told her she couldn't go, that feeling of um, heaviness and dread and all that stuff that was within me went away. It was like, as soon as I stopped that incident, Okay. All right. Good. Good. Oh, wow. That's a good way to use it, though. That really is. That that is. I don't know if I still would call it deja vu, but uh, whatever it was, it was you. You handled it very well. Um. Can you tell us a little bit about what you teach? Yeah, that's in in the book. I'm not gonna. I can't do that. No. No. I teach in a group. Uh, you know, I, I I play games. We play games. Uh, it's all in the book. Uh, uh, but I, I don't know how to tell you. I teach. Uh, how to teach? It's, it, we play uh, a lot of games. That's all. And, and without knowing it, they start using their psychic ability. Do you believe we all have the same psychic ability? About as much as I believe we all can spell or write or read. Yes, yeah, some of us have uh, it stronger. Uh, like art, uh, some of us uh, can draw a little bit, but some of us are just masters at it. Same as uh, mathematicians, uh, we can all do a certain amount of math, but some are just brilliant in in understanding and exploring math. So, same thing with the psychic, we all have it, it to different various degrees. Well, for a lot of people, I hear that it has to do with like your birth date and what sign you are, and some people are more psychic than others. So I just no, wondered. I, think, I don't think it has anything to do with your birthday. Probably family, because I think it does run uh, to some extent in the families. But uh, you know, I know psychics from all different months of the year. Uh, so I don't know about that. But I, I do think that the family, uh, if, if they're aware of it or not, it usually is goes in the family. Huh. Well, I, I wondered that just because, I mean, I'm a Pisces and everybody says, well, Pisces are more psychic than others. But, you know, I have friends that are not the same sign as me that are, I think, a little bit better at it than I am or a little bit more in tuned, I should say. Yeah, I think maybe more aware or, or trust themselves. It just seems like you have this great ability and you just don't trust yourself enough. But, well, but sometimes you do because you stopped your daughter from going to that uh, friend's house. I trust myself when it's stuff like that. But um, what you do, I don't. I don't know if I could do that for the reason that you know. I just I worry that I'm describing an innocent person or something that's coming across for a different reason. So that's that's why that's where I don't trust myself. But after you do one or two and you realize, I mean, if you do psychic readings and start getting your accuracy, knowing that you can do this, I mean, you just don't leap into police work. Uh, you know, I, do, I worked the nightclubs for not, not a few months, and I went to Duke University to see uh, if I was crazy or if I really had the skill. And then I, I've been associated with uh, Duke and the Psychical Research Foundation for all my life, you know. Doing research was really good. I enjoyed that. But just practicing on your friends, you know, giving, having your daughter bring home something that somebody at school touched and you describing that person. You've never seen, you don't know who that person is. It's the per, you're holding a pencil that this girl always writes with. And you describe her. And then you 
your daughter will say, yeah, it was really good, and no, you're really off, you'll know. I had one incident where um, I had a friend who, um, in high school, uh, there was a girl that she used to talk to a lot who had ended up committing suicide. And uh, she took me to the this little girl's grave. And the more I got there, the more I just felt this overwhelming grief and sorrow and how alone this girl was. And it's like I could, I started to almost hear what this little girl was saying. And, mm-hmm. and I told her, I said, you know, this, I couldn't help it. It just kind of came out of my mouth. But I told her, you know, this little girl wants to thank you for being one of the only friends that she had. And she wants you to know that she was so lonely that she didn't know another way out. She didn't know, you know, how to get through her life anymore. It was so empty and so devastating for her that this was her only way out. And I started to describe, you know, the personality of this girl. And it, for me, that was shocking. That's the closest I ever came to, you know, being that accurate. So for me, that was, you know, not something that I expected and not something that I could explain. Right, right, yeah. It, it is very difficult to explain. I don't think that should be your job is to explain. They have the scientists to explain. They have the parapsychologists. Your job is just to do the best you can. But we're not going to have much more time because we started late, So, and I've got people coming soon. So is there a few more questions you'd like to ask before I go? Um, I would like to know if um, where would someone go if they wanted to uh, have a class with you. Can they do it online, or is there a place that you teach? I don't know how how to do it online. I've got to figure out, you know, I'm old as hell, and I have no idea how they do that online, but I travel. So, you know, you get you get a group together, and if it's worth my while, uh, I'll be happy to go up there and, and teach a weekend or something. Oh, that's awesome. Um, can yeah, you I, like, I like teaching in, in person. And I also do psychic stuff, and at the end we do a little trance. Um, Can you give us your websites on where we can find you and get to know a little bit more about you? It's it's my name. You know, those W's in my name, Noreen Renair. NoreenRenair.com. That is awesome. I think what you do is amazing, and I want to thank you for what you do. You know, well, I, I thank you for calling, and I just wish I could give you the magic potion to believe in yourself, because you sound like a very talented lady, very talented. Well, thank you. Um, for me, I mean, for me, it started out um, kind of crazy. Uh, my grandfather passed in 1990, and when I woke up in the morning um, of that day, I looked at my mom and I said, you know. I can't go to school today. I was going to cosmetology class. I said, I can't go today. My grandpa's going to die. And that was her dad. And and she looked at me and said, don't talk like that. Because we didn't even know anything was wrong with him. Uh, Oh, I love that. I love that. Well, I went in and I laid back down to go to sleep. And all of a sudden, before I know it, my body wasn't standing in the same room with him, but I was. And I watched his morning unfold, and I watched him put my cousin on the bus, and I watched him walk in the house and drop dead in his chair. I saw everything wow. with clear... How old were you? How old were you? Um, I was 18, almost 18. Wow. But, I mean, I mean, after that, I think, oh, and you're young, of course, and there was no one probably to guide you. And, um, you know, people are thinking you're crazy or don't talk like that or... Well, that's impressive that what you did, that you left the body. So there's so, you've got to get, you got to find the practical psychic and practice some of those things in there and, and get your confidence up and, and, and do what you're supposed to be doing because you're, you're too talented not, not to use your own abilities for more. Well, thank you. So, you know. I've got to go. Got to go. Okay, can I give you a hug, a phone hug? Absolutely. <laughs> and here's a phone hug back. You are amazing. And like I said, I am so thankful for what you do, helping all those people. You know, I just want to thank you so much for taking your time to come on here and chat with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. And keep in touch, okay? I definitely will. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. That was amazing, guys. Um Sorry to cut that a little bit short. Uh, she had some things that she had to do today. Um, and we kind of got a late start because here where I live, we had no electric and, you know, for a while this morning because, <laughs> excuse me, in Candigua, New York, we kind of uh, 
had an electrical storm this morning that was crazy, and it kind of rocked us pretty good here. Um, our elect or our lights, you know, flashed and flashed, and then all of a sudden the school was calling my cell phone, t saying that there was an hour delay, and then all of a sudden they were calling back with a two-hour delay, and it was crazy here. Um, I don't know if you guys pay attention, but I had read about a solar flare that was supposed to hit uh, between the 22nd and the 23rd, which was supposed to be this morning. And uh, crazy enough, at 5.30 this morning, um, there was a crazy electrical storm out there that that shook the place. But um, she is definitely amazing. And I advise you to go on her website and check her out because she is great. Um Again, that was Um She is just, she's fabulous, and she's the real deal. Um, I've, I've gone through her website, and I think it's great. And she has two books out there, um, A Mind for Murder and The Practical Psychic. So if you guys get the chance, go on and check her out. And, you know, grab her books. You know, I'm definitely going to. I look forward to reading each one of her books. She is definitely a special person to, to help people out the way she does. And uh, again, I just I want to send out a special thanks to her. Um, well, that's all we have time for today. Um, we post our shows on YouTube. And if you want to know more about our guests and upcoming shows, just visit us at Info to Rail webpage, I-N-F-O number two rail. Um, just Google Info to Rail and click on our Google Sites page. Or uh, you can go to our... Uh, YouTube page where all of our um, interviews are. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us here at Info to Rail. Y you know, the guests and the listeners are what makes this show. I know I tell you guys that every week, but I can't stress it enough how thankful I am to each and every one of you for being here each week and, and joining us. And I really hope to see you here each and every week. We have new guests and some, you know, amazing new subjects. Uh, nobody's ever the same and that's what makes it fun. You know, everybody has their own talent and it's, for me, it's amazing to have the opportunity to be able to sit down and chat with these guests and, um, you know, open a whole new world for not only me, but for the listeners as well. Um, it helps me to grow and learn with each and every interview I do. Um, so definitely hope to see you here each week. And I want to thank uh, my YouTube subscribers, uh, you know, I'm getting three or four a day, and I want to thank you guys so much for your support. I, You don't know how much that means to me. Um, you can also go on uh, Facebook as well, has my Info to Rail page on my Facebook as well. And, you know, I invite you to come and check that out. Um, on the Info to Rail website, every week I post missing persons. So if you guys could come on there and just have a look and maybe read about these people. And, you know, when you're out and about in your busy day, maybe you can take a little bit of time to look around. Or maybe if you've seen this person or you know anything about these situations, don't be afraid to call your local 911. Um, as I said, today is dedicated to uh, Sharon Pryor. And uh, I... I'm really hoping to get the word out there that somebody may know something or um, can help solve that case because, you know, that family deserves to have justice for Sharon. Um, thank you guys so much again. May God bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you in these uncertain times. We'll see you soon. <laughs>